So I'm here to talk about my brother, Cedric Cannon, who was my older brother, who I lost to fentanyl. We grew up in a small town in Florida. It was five girls and two boys. Cedric was the third oldest. He was the oldest son. We grew up in a low-income housing, single-parent household, and but we had a lot of love and we had a lot of joy. It was always fun and something amazing to do growing up. My fondest memories of Cedric, he loved the Lakers and he always had this Lakers jersey in the closet and I would open the closet and I would always want to wear his jersey. I loved it. And I love when he would take me around with his friends, like hanging out with them, playing basketball. And he was very protective over us. He really loved us. And he also loved wrestling. So any of the new, the latest wrestling moves, he would always practice on the younger siblings. So we were the guinea pigs. And so um, that's, those are the memories that I remember, you know, him setting up the Nintendo for us to play. My mom said as a child, he loved to go to church. My mom, she was a Sunday school teacher for many years. She still actually goes to the same church that we grew up in. So she's been there over 40 years. So we always had that foundation in the church. Even in Cedric's addiction, he always carried that with him. He never lost that. And my mom said when he was a little boy, he would always carry this little Bible around with him. And he loved going to church. And in school, he was uh, very comical. Like, he was a good kid. He was obedient. But he loved to make people laugh. He was kind of like, you know, they would say he was like the class clown. My mom said about when she, she ended up marrying my stepfather. Cedric was about 19 at the time, she said. And then he, you know, moved out at the time. He started experimenting with drugs. And that began his downward spiral with addiction. I don't remember like exactly what age, but I remember one of my siblings mentioning that, you know, my brother was on drugs. And I remember I didn't want to believe it. I was in complete denial. And I was like, if I don't deal with this, it's not true. And because I wasn't around him all of the time, I was, you know, I went off to college and it made it easy to just not believe that it was true. As I got, you know, older, uh, I would notice different things, you know, um, but he was never like the stereotypical you know, if you see somebody and you say, oh, I can tell they're an addict, even, you know, before he passed, he never had the typical, you know, addict, whatever that stereotype is. He never had that. Like, he never looked to me like an addict. But um, our family, like people that are close to us, you know, we would know, like he would ask for money or he would do certain things. There was, you know, that comes with addiction. And the thing about it, we're from a really small town. So if you're doing something, if you're, you know, it, word gets around, you know. So that was another thing. We're from a small town. People start talking. And then also, too, he, it, you know, he was open about it as well. Like, he wouldn't hide his addiction. We, you know, he was open about it. Hey, I'm not no preacher. And I'm not a... Uh so filled with the Holy Ghost and, 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 and living perfect or nothing, but I need help. You know what I'm saying? And I figure a lot of y'all need help too. A lot of y'all be liking some of my posts and be seeing a lot of things that I write on Facebook and I don't want nobody to never think that I'm holier than thou or, and, 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 and got that type of attitude. I'm just a person who I like to fellowship with those who may feel where I'm coming from, I may understand the the, uh, the spiritual warfare that that goes along with those who are trying to seek Christ. So, uh, if you got any problems or you got any issues that you're going through, and you need somebody to talk to, I'm here for you. You know what I'm saying? You can inbox me. You know what I'm saying? I see my number. We can talk on to Messenger, or whatever, man. I just it does a lot to help my soul, and um, it uplifts my spirit. The fellowship with those.
may, who, who are suffering or those who have testimony. So I'm just throwing it out there for anybody who might feel that. And it's for anyone. You know, don't feel embarrassed or none of that. You know, I'm an open book. I don't got nothing to hide. So God has put it on my heart to put this out there. So uh, feel welcome if you if you want to. You know, God bless us. My sister said that he told her at 17, that's when he started experimenting with drugs with a family member. And so she said, um, I don't know like when this was, but there was a certain time, you know, she was in the car, they were riding together and he broke down to her and he said that um, he didn't want that life for himself. But, you know, it's just one of those things that he just didn't know how to get free from. And it just kind of followed him for the rest of his life until it ended his life. I asked my mom when she found out, and she said it was not until years later because she never noticed any differences in his behavior or, you know, and she was like, she was so clueless, like drugs. You know, we didn't deal with anybody in our family with drugs, so that wasn't on the radar. It was nothing that we would be looking for or pick up on any cues. So it was really, it really blindsided her that this was an issue. So at first, um, I know at a time that he was addicted to cocaine. Um, and then I know at one point it was crack. And then um, at the time of his death, his autopsy report said it was um, meth toxicity and fentanyl toxicity. So I'm not sure when, you know, he started diving into other things. And right before he passed, my niece was taking him somewhere and she was talking to him about fentanyl. And he told her, no, I don't do that. You know, I don't, I don't do that. And so I know it wasn't something that he was out looking for, or um, even though he had battled with addiction, we had heard about other people in our hometown that had died from fentanyl. And he was, you know, telling my sister about it, like, hey, you know, you know, this guy that we all knew from our hometown, like, can you believe like this guy, you know, he passed away and they were like, oh, you know, that's so sad. So, so just a little backstory. Um, so many things were happening leading up, up into his death. Uh, one of my nieces, she used to do like this um, prayer line with her friends. And she invited my brother to, hey, I want you to get on this prayer call. And he said, like, all day he was trying to get out of the house. He was, you know, trying to get out. But for whatever reason, he couldn't leave that day. So he said, okay, I'll get on this prayer call. And so... Um, they ended up like praying for him and they had him read, read Psalm 91. And he was like, oh, you know, this was awesome. I'm going to come back on the next night. Well, the next night, you know, nobody could find him. Nobody could get a hold of him for a couple days. Um, when he was found, they believe he had already been gone for two days. And that was so devastating to know that, you know, he died alone. That was hard for me and my mom because we both felt that way, like he had to die alone. And growing up, my mom, she was really strong, you know, having seven kids and doing the best that she could. And I never saw my mom cry. And the first time I saw my mom cry was at my brother's wake. And so this is what fentanyl does to people. So that was very hard to see my mom, you know, cry. It's like your, all of our lives, like when once we found out he had an addiction, it's like you're holding your breath because you, you're dreading getting that call. And when you finally get the call, it's like your worst nightmare. It finally happened that you never wanted to happen. It came true. I've lost people before, 
But this is just so different when it's your sibling, when it's to something that's like an addiction that you know this person has wanted to get out of and they can't and you don't know how to help. Like when I was, when I found out about this, I was so young. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to deal with it. And one of the things that I would want people to get from this story is that if you have a loved one that you know is an addict, I built up a lot of walls kind of to protect myself. And I was afraid to, you know, fully, I think, love him because I was afraid of, you know, when we would get that call. But I think what I wish I would have done differently was just to love him more, tell him I love him more, ask him about his story, ask him, you know, why did you do this? Like, not in a judgmental way, but just trying to understand, even though I could never understand an addict, I can never understand what their struggles are, but I wish I would have tried to understand his perspective and his struggles and let him know that, you know, I was there for him. I was supporting him, not his addiction, not saying to enable them, but just, I think it has to be a balance. You don't want to enable them, but you also want them to know that, you know what, I still love you. And he was so loving, like, of course, with addicts, you it's difficult sometimes. You know, the lying, they can manipulate, you know, asking for money, you know, so it can be very easy to build up walls. But I think there has to be the balance of the compassion as well, knowing that most people don't set out to be addicts. They don't, you know, want this life, but it's so hard to get out. So that's why it's don't even start. Don't try anything. Don't start it. Don't do it. So the investigation really didn't go too far. I feel like, um, as I hear with a lot of cases, it's kind of like, you know, once it's found that they've passed from fentanyl, it's closed book, it's over. Um, and that's basically how it was. It was no further investigation really after that. Cedric, just like a lot of addicts, they're not, they're not just addicts. They're more than that. You know, he was very loving and he had a lot of friends. He loved people. He had a heart for people and he was so forgiving. Like you can get into an argument with said and he would forgive you. And that was, he would always talk about love. And like I said, he, of course he was not perfect. Addicts, addiction comes with a lot of stuff. And it can be so hard to deal with addicts. You know, Cedric was hard to deal with sometimes, but he had such a great heart. You know, he was somebody's brother. He was my brother. You know, he was my mom's son. So he was just so much more, and I want people to know that. He was more than an addict, and he had so much um, to offer this world. Even in his addiction and being around people with addiction, he would still try to help them. Even though he couldn't help himself, he would still try to speak life into them and try to help them to get out. And so many people, like, after he passed, like, on his... Um, Facebook page is so many like messages of how he touched people, like how he encouraged people. He never lost that. Um, he never lost that. And um, that's what I want people to know about him. <laughs>